Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Critical Issues Forum Online Teachers Workshop. Today's lecture is using new tools and uh, approaches for non-proliferation and disarmament verification and monitoring with a special emphasis on North Korea by Ms. Anna Peregrino. So I would like to introduce Anne briefly, and I'm so happy to have Anne for this year's Critical Issues Forum uh, Teachers Workshop. Anna, Pe Anna Peregrino is the manager of the Nuclear Threat Initiative and a research associate. So we use a lot of uh, educational resources on the NETI website for the Critical Issues Forum project. So there are so many useful educational materials targeting younger audience. So I highly encourage you to visit the NETI website. And of course, I'm going to include the NETI website in the useful resources um, uh, list. So Anne helps maintain NTI's online collection of profiles of countries, treaties, international organizations, as well as various databases, videos, and educational tutorials. Mm -hmm. Anne's areas of research include weapons of mass destruction issues in Syria, nuclear power and non-proliferation, mm -hmm. and using new tools for open source analysis. Previously, Anne worked as a graduate research assistant at CNS. Anne earned her BA in International Affairs from the University of Georgia in 2016, where she was a, a Richard B. Russell Security Leaders Scholars and graduated some cum laude. She then earned her MA in Non-Proliferation and Terrorism Studies from the Middlebury Institute of International Studies. So today, I'm, Anne is going to give the lecture on the new tools. So I'm very excited to, about this lecture. So Anne, I'm going to give it a microphone. Thank you, Masako. Um, hello, everybody watching. I am really excited to give this talk and um, Masco said that I will be talking about what we call new tools and how we use them for uh, proliferation monitoring and um, how they can help us with uh, kind of fighting the dangers of nuclear proliferation. First, I want to talk a little bit about what exactly are new tools. New tools is a bit of a misnomer. It's more of a combination of software, techniques, um, types of research that we do. And uh, one thing that's really important to mention is that th the new tools that I will discuss with you are, they do not replace the traditional research that we do at places like CNS and others, but they supplement our research. And in this day and age when people are constantly online and everything is help us convey important information in a, in a way that is easier for people to digest and helps them kind of understand the implications of the issues that we talk about when it comes to nuclear weapons um, better. So new tools, uh, it's kind of this bucket of things and all of them are open source. And what open source means is that anybody can access them. That means that you all um, can have the, uh, the ability to um, um, on your own after I talk about them. The one caveat with open source is that it does not mean free. Especially, um, I'll talk about this a bit when I talk about uh, satellite imagery, but Often there is a financial barrier to using these tools, um, but what is good about being at an educational institution is that often we can partner with these companies so that they will give us the tools or the data for free so that we can conduct our research. But for most of the things that I will discuss, there is a way that all of you can access uh, these tools. New tools also is not just the object or the uh, software that we use. It's also kind of this bag of 
creative approaches to research and kind of creative uses for software. There was an instance a couple weeks ago where one, uh, a student here actually was trying to use um, Photoshop, Adobe Photoshop, which is traditionally for editing photos, making them more beautiful, using certain tools within Photoshop to take measurements of um, missiles, measurements that are highly accurate. And when we try to contact Photoshop to, to help, to get some help on how to use this tool that we were trying to apply, the person on the other end of the phone was, they, their mind was blown. They really had no idea um, how to help us because we were entering into territory that they had never heard of someone um, using their, their product in that way. So it's also being on kind of the cutting edge of creative research, which is really valuable um, and, and really awesome to be in that environment right now. We also talk about societal verification. So in a day and age where everybody is on the internet, we can harness the power of the crowd to help us do research. We also can use social media for a lot of our research. When we do kind of new tools research, a lot of it is based off of photos and videos because we as researchers cannot actually go and visit these places and these things that we are trying to assess. So social media is actually a wonderful way of helping us get even closer to what we're trying to research. And I will talk about that uh, further into my presentation. There are several kind of buckets of new tools, I'd call them. So, you know, it's again, a mixture of tools and techniques and kind of the three categories that we put them into would be satellite imagery analysis. So uh, there are a lot of satellites up in space that take images and we can use those images to, in, in various ways to gather information about a place, an event, um, a new type of missile system, um, something like that. We also do a lot of work with photo and video interpretation. And mostly what that means is uh, fotting, uh, spotting fakes. So um, kind of fake news, trying to debunk things that may not actually be uh, reality. It also means doing, uh, using photos and videos to take really good measurements of things that we see in photos so that we can better assess their capabilities. And then kind of dovetailing into that is using 3D modeling and uh, simulation software to help us understand just how far a missile could fly um, or how powerful a nuclear weapon might actually be if detonated. And when we use new tools in the context of nuclear non-proliferation, a lot of the things that we're doing are these four categories. We are trying to locate where in the world an image or a video was taken. That can help us know where there are important uh, facilities that could be related to missile production, nuclear weapons design, in countries like North Korea and Iran, um, when states publish photos and videos, we want to know where those were taken. Also, we work really hard to determine the authenticity of an event or a narrative. This is especially important for people that I work with as in the wake of the Iraq war invasion in 2003, there was only one story that was put forth by the government. And independent analysts like um, the people here at CNS didn't have the tools to assess whether or not that story was true or not. Today, because of all of these tools and these techniques, we are in a much better position to 
be an independent check on governments and um, or people who might be working for nefarious uh, aims. When it comes to facilities that might be associated with missile production, nuclear weapons production, um, or even chemical or biological weapons production, we often, we can't go visit those sites, and so we need ways in which to determine uh, a suspicious facility's purpose. And then also, again, we can assess the capabilities of technology like missiles or nuclear weapons. It's really amazing what you can do being so far removed from North Korea or Iran, uh, just the amount of information that we can get here in our offices and the, the kinds of, of, of analytical insights that we can glean. So first up, the first bucket is satellite imagery. And satellite imagery is probably the single most important tool that we use in our work. It allows us to keep a close eye on North Korea. It allows us to keep a close eye on Iran, um, on Russia, really any country that you want, you can look at with satellite imagery. And satellite imagery is really cool because really only a few decades ago, satellite imagery and satellites were only the were only used by governments in a classified form. Really in the last decade, there has been an explosion of private companies that have created and put into space constellations of tiny satellites that are about the size of a shoebox. And with those satellites, we, as a non-governmental organization, can access that imagery. You also can access that imagery. Unfortunately, in some instances, it's not free. There are some platforms that you can access satellite imagery for free. Um, I will have Masako give you some um, examples of those so you can, can try it out for yourselves. Um, but it's an incredible democratizing of information that's happening with satellite imagery. And when it comes to the different types of sensors that we can use to uh, better, better analyze what's happening on the ground in North Korea or wherever, there are a couple of different types of sensors that are most useful. So the main one that I'll talk about is optical satellite imagery. Optical satellite imagery is basically like a picture. It is the visible light spectrum, so what your eyes see is what's reflected in the image. So if you could imagine you yourself being up in space on the satellite looking down at the Earth, what you would see is what is reflected in an optical satellite image. It's what, if you have ever looked at satellite images before, and so in this case right here, um, these are two images of a satellite launch pad in Iran. And the image on the left-hand side, that is showing the pad right before a satellite launch test. That was in February of this, the, this year. On the right-hand side, in the image where there's an arrow and it says burn scar, that was taken almost immediately after the test had occurred. And with these two images, we're able to assess whether or not that test was successful. And because of the burn scar, that indicated to us that the test had failed. Typically, we do not see those types of scarring in images if a test has been successful. After we published this with NPR, it, uh, Iran did admit that this was a failed launch. So optical is really powerful when you are looking at a, the same location over multiple periods of time. You can see pretty clearly when things change. 
this image right here, this, we were actually really lucky because this image is of a pretty high resolution. When we get satellite imagery, there's usually a scale in terms of how much you can see. So sometimes images will be pretty blurry and we can't actually glean a lot of information from those. I, I don't remember the exact resolution of these images, but they are likely about 50 centimeters, which means that per each pixel in the image, that's reflecting 50 centimeters on the ground. So we can actually see a lot of detail. Another type of sensor or uh, what you can see is called near infrared. And near infrared is a band of the sensor that allows you to view um, the health of crop vegetation. So traditionally, it's most useful for farmers, uh, big commercial farmers who want to assess the health of their crops. Um, we realized that it's possible to use near-infrared satellite imagery to pick up on burn scars from um, missile tests. And so in this instance right here, in uh, like around October 15th, 2016, North Korea conducted two tests of one of its uh, ballistic missiles. And in this image, this is showing the location of where that test occurred. And I will tell you that the bright red spots that you see, that is reflecting healthy vegetation where there's any dark brown or black spots, that is um, showing dead vegetation. And so because of the rocket engine, uh, which creates a ground scar and burns the surrounding area, we can actually see where that test occurred, where, for example, so you'll have to see if you can pick this up on your own. Um, so this is the near-infrared image. I circled the location of one of the failed tests for you. And then if you were to look at a simple optical image of the same airbase, it's really hard to see that same spot. If I, as an analyst, were just looking at this image and trying to assess where the test might have occurred, because the surrounding area, the grass is already brown and whatnot, it would be really hard for me to tell where exactly the test took place. But with the near-infrared image, we can hone in pretty quickly on where that test occurred. And then a few days later, there was actually a second test that, was, um, that also failed. So, I will give y'all a minute to think about where that second failed test might be before I show you the yellow circle for where it is. It's actually quite close to where the first failed test was. It's a smaller patch. It's actually slightly more noticeable than the other one. But again, if you were to look simply at the optical image, that is not apparent. So the near-infrared imagery is really powerful uh, when it comes to determining whether a missile test has occurred, if it's been successful. Um, important data points that when North Korea tests, they don't often tell us where. Um, and so we like to think of it as a game of trying to find out where and when the actual tests occurred. And then my favorite sensor, it's not actually, it doesn't use light like the other two. When we talk about satellite imagery, most of the time you're thinking about how the camera sensor takes in light from the environment and then interprets that into a photo. There are also sensors that use radar and these sensors are incredibly powerful for a couple reasons. When we use 
optical imagery, there are several issues that arise potentially. We have to get really lucky about when we actually can task a satellite to take an image for us. If it is cloudy or rainy or snowy that day, then it's unlikely that we're gonna get a good image. The climate and weather concerns can often impede on optical imagery. Synthetic aperture radar, on the other hand, is an incredible tool because you can see through clouds. It does not matter what the weather is. It can also see through trees and sometimes even the roof of certain buildings, depending on the material that was used to build the building or whatever. This instance, this image right here is actually two images, one before and one after North Korea's most recent and largest nuclear test at its nuclear test site. And if you can see the image moving slightly, kind of looks like the top of the mountain is breathing almost. Synthetic aperture radar actually picked up on the minute changes to the top of the mountain that occurred when they detonated the nuclear test. The test was so large that it actually collapsed the very top of the mountain. And that's what you're seeing when the image is breathing. You see the original area where the land was and then how when the detonation exploded, it creates a cavity and that cavity then collapses and causes the top of the mountain to sink slightly. With optical imagery, again, this is really hard to see, especially because the mountain is covered with trees. That ground scarring and that pattern of movement is not always apparent. And that's why synthetic aperture radar is super important. In this instance, synthetic aperture radar, because we could see the movement of the mountain, we could make a better estimate of how large that explosion was. This was important because there were a number of people who claimed that North Korea was not capable of conducting a thermonuclear explosion, which is way more powerful and what kind of all countries who have nuclear weapons have um, aspired to achieve. And with this test, it was clear to us that North Korea is finally capable of producing a thermonuclear weapon, which is, um, was, was quite scary. Next, I'm gonna talk about photo interpretation. And this is kind of the realm that we are kind of on the cutting edge of right now and the work that I find the, the, the most fascinating in my day-to-day -day job at this very moment. So one of the things that we do when we talk about photo interpretation is detecting manipulations. So when you think about manipulations, you often think about um, kind of at like the fashion ads and things where people are clearly photoshopping their bodies to make them look better. North Korea, it, it's interesting because North Korea is actually a country that um, does manipulate its photos and they do it for both um, cosmetic region, re reasons, like just making things look better, but they also do it sometimes to obscure what actually happened in reality. And as we run photos through software over time, over different events, we have noticed that as North Korea's ability to produce missiles has increased, as they've gotten better at producing this technology, that the type of manipulations that we see in photographs has actually gone from obscuring reality to just making things look better. And the reason why is because the tests are successful. They don't need to pretend 
that a failed test was actually successful because they are now successful. They are now good at making ballistic missiles and testing them. Um, so that has been a really interesting and, and concerning trend that we have seen because we now know for certain that they are capable of producing this technology. In this one instance, this was a test a number of years ago of North Korea's uh, submarine launched ballistic missile. And, you know, I'll give you a moment to assess the photo. But basically what we have is the missile in the center of the frame is being ejected out of the water from, not from a submarine this time, but from an underwater platform to test the um, ejection mechanisms for the missiles. And so we see it ejecting out of the water and then it will ignite and then fly off. This is a photo, this is the same photo after we have put it through a software called Tungsten. And what Tungsten does at a really high level is to be able to pick up on changes to photos that we cannot see with our eyes. So, you know, sometimes you can see in people's photos when they do a really horrible job photoshopping and their arms or their legs look all weird or they have an extra arm somewhere that someone forgot about. <coughs> that is not the case uh, with, with North Korea. They do a fairly good job of photoshopping their photos. And so we need a more powerful tool like Tungsten to help us suss out any changes. So I'll just give you a brief overview of what this picture is showing right now. So if you notice that the sky is all a single dark purple color, what that tells us is that North Korea completely blurred out the sky. And this is a total cosmetic change. It might have been that the clouds looked funky that day or whatnot. So they just, they just blurred the entire background so that the sky looked uniform it makes for a better photo. When you look at the water, the changes in the color, that is actually accurate. Because when the, it gets quite complicated, but essentially the only thing in this photo that is concerning to us is the bright red square on the missile. And if we look back at what that was in the photo, you can see that at the near the top of the missile, there is a checkerboard pattern on the missile. So something has been done to that part of the missile. We don't know if it is an actual change to the missile or if it's just a change to the photograph. Here we have a close up. So we have the missile where you can see the checkerboard pattern. And then in the middle, you can see where we've detected the manipulation. And then on the far right hand side, it's a bit hard to tell, but basically what you're looking at is video that the North Koreans took of the same missile being ejected from underwater. So you're looking at it underwater, and then in the other pictures, it has breached the surface. And if you look closely at the missile that's underwater, you can see that the area in which there's a checkerboard pattern on the missile when it's out of the water, that pattern is not there underwater. So essentially the conclusion that we came to is that for a better photo, North Korea added this checkerboard pattern to the missile. We don't know if Maybe the missile was painted beforehand and the paint came off in the test. We don't know exactly why. Um, all we know is that really for just a better looking photo, they altered the image. Another thing that we can do with photo interpretation is we can actually take really, really good measurements of missiles. 
This is some of the work that actually our students here do and is really impressive uh, to see what they have uh, been able to been able to learn how to do in you know such a short amount of time. Uh, but essentially, using Photoshop, there is a tool that allows you to correct the perspective of the camera. And when you do that, it allows you to take more accurate measurements of whatever object you're interested in a photo. So in this picture right here, this is just showing the lineup of the, of, of the Soviet Union's old Iskander missile, and then three of North Korea's uh, KN-23 short-range ballistic missiles, which bear a striking resemblance to the Iskander. And the student who did this, he took all of these photos, lined them up, and then was able to take a series of measurements that shows that, yes, the dimensions of these missiles actually lines up pretty perfectly. And then when we take all of these super precise measurements, that helps us with our 3D modeling work. So this is an example of a 3D model that one of our students, again a student, um, produced using the measurements that the other students took. So when you go to our uh, CNS Sketchfab account, that's a really awesome resource to see all of the 3D models that we've ever produced. And essentially, when you're looking at our 3D models, they're not just built based upon what the designer sees visually in the photos, but what we have been able to measure accurately in those photos. So we are able to create really accurate scale models of everything, which is something that we are really proud of doing because it's not only a better model, but it is providing it's more value added information for our research. Which brings me to 3D modeling and simulations. 3D modeling is really fun work because the programs that we use, again, are free. And so if anyone is interested, um, you can download the programs yourselves. The main, that when, the main one that we use is called Blender. And it was actually developed by several animators from Pixar Studios way back in the day. And people can create amazing objects and scenes and animations using the software. And we have been lucky enough to apply that to the nuclear nonproliferation space. So for instance, a couple years ago, we set about modeling North Korea's nuclear test site at Pongiri. And why this was important is that we know kind of where the test site is. We had an idea of the layout of the test site, but no one had ever actually been into the tunnels but we wanted to know what would a plausible configuration be for what the complex looks like underneath the mountain. And so there were a few things that we did in order to reach the final product, which was this uh, 3D model, which again, you all will have access to and can go essentially walk around in yourselves. But basically, when North Korea tested each of its six tests, we received, or the entire world received, um, seismic data. And the seismic data tells us, it's kind of like, or it, it, it typically is for earthquakes, but it can also tell us a lot about nuclear explosions that are underground. And in this instance, 
we knew approximately where the test occurred and the yield of the explosion. And those two data points are important because when you conduct underground nuclear tests, there are very specific parameters that you have to follow to make sure that you can contain that explosion under the earth. In some instances, if this is not done correctly, then a test can vent, and that means that it will release radioactive gases and nasty stuff into the atmosphere, and nobody wants that. So, Again, you have to contain your tests in a certain way to keep them and everyone else, to keep the tests contained and to keep everyone safe. Also, it is, it, it prevents other countries from learning more information about uh, the capabilities of your test. So if we know the yield of the explosion and the approximate locations of where they all took place in relation to one another, we can create an accurate model based on equations and a whole bunch of other things about what that configuration might look like. And so we created the tunnel complex that you see on the right hand side and then we used other satellite data in the in the form of um, digital elevation model data which gives you a very uh, precise very precise measurements for the topography of the earth and so when we put that on top of each other we were able to fit the tunnel configuration underneath the mountain in a way that all of the tests would be properly contained. This was the first time that anyone had ever done this before. Uh, it was a really incredible project to be a part of, and um, we actually continued to update this model as we know more about um, the site. And I will say that in the image on the right hand side, the reason why there is a Statue of Liberty in that image is because there was an article in the newspaper that came out about when uh, President, U.S. President Trump's aides were trying to brief him on this site in order to help him kind of understand the magnitude of the site and the explosion sizes. They dropped a scale model of the Statue of Liberty into um, like a diorama that they had put together of the site. So he could see just how large the cavity was of the sixth test in relation to the Statue of Liberty. So we thought it would be fun to give everybody the same ability to uh, understand just how big these explosions actually uh, were. Back to missiles, when North Korea or any country really unveils a new missile system, immediately we put our students on creating a new 3D model for it. In the graphic that you see here, uh, this actually has to be updated because North Korea has shown off a couple new missiles since we've actually produced this, uh, but essentially we create a highly accurate 3D model of every single missile that has ever been produced, or all of the missiles that we know of that have ever been produced. Um, in this instance, we have a, the lineup of North Korea's missiles, and they are associated with their ranges. So the um, Hwasong-15, which is North Korea's intercontinental range ballistic missile, it's their largest, um, their largest missile with the longest range. That actually can, um, we can conclusively say that it would be able to target anywhere in the continental United States. So it is a very long range and it is a missile that we are very concerned about. 
We also model bomb designs. So there have been two instances where North Korea has shown off two devices. This device here is affectionately known as the disco ball. And it's called the disco ball because of the pattern that you see on the outside of the device, which is the, um, the pattern of the um, high explosives that compress the device, which then compresses the, the pit, which then causes the nuclear explosion. So when we saw these pictures of, North, of, of Kim Jong-un, um, with this device, we immediately set off uh, trying to make a, an accurate 3D model of the device. Um, the image in the right-hand corner that shows a cutaway of the device, that is simply based on our best guess and our knowledge of existing devices. We did not actually see any photos of the inside of the device. Uh, that type of information is probably something that we're never ever going to get from North Korea, um, but there are only so many ways that you can produce a nuclear weapon, so it's a very highly educated guess about what the inside could potentially, or it's a highly educated guess of a kind of mock-up of what the inside could be. We also modeled North Korea's uh, supposed thermonuclear device, the thermonuclear weapon. Um, this is a much more powerful device and was very concerning when, when we saw these images. And what's actually interesting is that when Kim Jong-un visited this factory, this, um, we think it's a research and development facility. The 24 hours after we saw this image was when North Korea conducted its sixth nuclear test. So, which, which people believe was with a thermonuclear device. Um, this image was probably an instance of North Korea signaling to us that this is what was going to happen, uh, but nobody expected it to take place less than 24 hours after they released this image. That was um, quite a shock. Um, but kind of the bottom line uh, for when we do 3D modeling is we're able to do things like, oh, just kidding. But basically when we do our 3D modeling, um, we try to scale everything so that it's the kind of appropriate size to what it would be in reality. And when it comes to um, bomb designs and missiles for North Korea, we can actually then take those bombs, stick them inside the nose cone of a missile, and we can actually tell sort of how much extra space is in the um, missile and how many, how many actual nuclear um, bombs um, that could be fit inside of uh, a missile. And that's uh, really in uh, valuable information. And then the last thing I'm going to talk about is the, the work that we do that is uh, kind of <laughs> bordering on, like, it, it's definitely the hard sciences, but it is uh, for a person with a simple policy background, it has challenged me a lot. Um, but basically, and I'm not sure if this is a program that you all have ever used in your uh, science classes, but basically there's a program called uh, Physics Tracker, and we can use that to track the acceleration of missiles from uh, videos that are taken of their launches. So let me see. Let's play this for you. So it's a little hard to tell, but behind all of those red dots in the video is a missile. And so what we've done is we've picked a point on that missile and we have tracked it throughout all of the frames. And then that is that gives us the um, the acceleration uh, rate of the missile. And when we know the acceleration 
with a couple of other calculations and some other details about the missile, it can tell us the thrust of the engine, which is you know, how powerful the engine is when uh, lifting off from the earth. That'll, that information can tell us how far the missile can go. So even if North Korea, even if North Korea you know, gave us this video and then didn't tell us any information about what this missile is, how powerful it is, how far it can fly, using programs like Tracker, we can figure that out. We might not be able to tell you the name of the missile, but we can tell you uh, approximately how far it can go. Another thing that can tell us how far a missile can go is actually what it looks like. And this is a, a really cool example of harnessing the power of social media as well. These pictures here are actually taken in Iran and they were of kind of a, a an event, it wasn't a parade, but it was a celebratory event after Iran unveiled one of its missiles called the Zulfgar. And the Zulfgar is important because it's one of a series of missiles where we have seen Iran to uh, quickly increase the range, uh, how far that missile can fly, which is concerning. And people were not quite sure how Iran was able to quickly extend the range. When we saw these photos that were taken from um, a university in Tehran, we noticed something really interesting. And it might be a little hard for you to see on your screen, but essentially, if you look really closely at the body of the missile, there's a slight ribbed pattern as you go along. The easiest one to see is in the picture where the guy is taking a selfie. Um, but basically, that ribbed pattern tells us what material the missile kind of airframe, the, the casing, is made out of. In this instance, it's made out of wound carbon fiber. When you're producing a missile, there are certain materials that you can use to build the outer airframe. Missiles long ago mostly used steel, which was heavy, and the heavy airframe meant that the missiles could not fly very far. Then countries started using a blend of steel and aluminum, which allowed them to fly even farther. Just aluminum for an airframe means that you can fly even farther. Carbon fiber is a very lightweight material. When you use it for the airframe of your missile, you can extend the range of that missile drastically without ever having to change the performance of the engine or any, really any other characteristics of the missile. Now, certainly there are things that you can do to then make it fly even farther. You could put a uh, more powerful engine um, on the missile, but essentially with this series of missiles in Iran, they were changing the airframe material, which meant that they were making the, the missile fly farther. So when we saw this picture with this different airframe material, that was a huge, huge uh, signal as to why this missile could fly so much farther than the missile that it was based upon. Um, here's another good picture. Maybe this one is a better, better visual for seeing the, the ribbed pattern on the missile. But essentially, we were then able to fly all of these missiles in some simulation software and our, the, the results kind of lined up pretty well with our hypothesis that all of these missiles, the reason why the range increased was because the weight of the airframe and the components that comprised of the missile weighed less.
these, this is just one case study where we have applied kind of this, these technologies. Um, but it's important because countries like North Korea, um, it's not just Iran who are pursuing better technologies for their missiles. And we have the ability to closely follow those developments um, and aren't really left in the dark about what's happening. We can have educated guesses about where their where their missile capabilities might be going. Like for instance, in North Korea, all of the 3D modeling and the simulation work that we have done points towards a North Korea that's capable of producing missiles that can fly even farther than the Hwasong-15, which is in and of itself quite scary. <coughs> Sorry. But basically, we are quite worried about what we're going to see next with North Korea, but we have the tools to be able to assess that and then to help push back against um, any narratives that arise as a result of um, what we might see next. So with all these tools, we have incredible power as researchers to, <coughs> sorry, to um, make sure that all people are, are more informed about what's going on in the world. And um, at this point, that's my last slide. That's my last tool that I'm going through. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, Moscow, if you would like to lead some discussion questions, I'd be happy to answer any of them. All right. Thank you so much. That's really fascinating. And uh, people like me, like <laughs> kind of all this time, it's just so fascinating information. And uh, just uh, before I go into some questions, so you you learned this at once you started uh, working as a graduate research assistant when you are a student. And uh, especially you said you are policy major student, and but you are doing looks like a really like a very tech oriented and it looks very uh, you know. To some extent, it yeah, you make a you make a really good point. Um, I, when I was growing up, the hard sciences and math were very difficult for me. It was not my specialty, and so I avoided them as best I could. So I took um, environmental science classes, which I loved. But then when I got to um, graduate school out here, I found that. I needed some more technical skills. And thankfully here at Ms., there were a couple of courses and people who were willing to mentor students on these technologies. And I came into this program at a, at a really great time because there has been a large emphasis on training the next generation in these tools. So trying to make sure that young people, um, especially those who are already pretty tech savvy, have the ability to uh, apply these tools to their research, whether they go on to work in the nonproliferation field or if it's something completely different. Uh, there are people who apply the same types of uh, tools and technologies when looking at um, uh, issues related to uh, terrorism and refugee issues, um, um, migration of people and resources. Really, the applications are kind of endless um, for all fields. Yeah, thank you. And uh, you also, at the very beginning, you mentioned using a new tool is not replacing uh, the existing uh, like a study and uh, it is kind of a supplement mm -hmm. so could you do you have a some uh, example like an uh, experience uh, that you really felt that you are like a you know through this project this project uh, do you have some uh, experience or example that you really felt you really supplementing the the existing sure. theoretical uh, traditional so-called traditional studies 
Yeah, absolutely. So um, I would say that when I uh, first came on as a full-time research associate here at CNS, the first project that I was put on was doing a historical analysis of Russia's um, old nuclear test site up on uh, Novaya Zemlya, which is an island chain up in the middle of the Arctic Ocean. It's really far away. It's um, inaccessible to researchers and the kind of traditional methods that we had of assessing the site were kind of anthologies and of, of testing activities that occurred at the site, um, memoirs from personnel who had worked on the site. Um, all of that information was deeply useful but there were no, it's, it's you need the, the written element, but you also need the visual aspect to help you understand a, a place or a facility. Um, and so using kind of the historical narrative in addition to satellite imagery helped us paint a picture of what life was like up there and what testing was like. Um, all of that would not have been possible without the historical, the written words and the old videos that people had and the old interviews that they gave. Um, and what was really important is that regarding the site in 1996, uh, 1997, there was an event, an earthquake occurred off the coast of this island chain and the United States thought that this was um, a nuclear explosion and that Russia had broken its moratorium on nuclear testing. This was a whole huge deal and one of the pieces of evidence that the United States cited was um, a satellite image showing a helicopter on the helicopter pad at the site. And Basing your analysis off of a single image is always going to be flawed because it does not, there's no context for that image. And so you need the written, you need, you need written accounts, whatever other information to make a more informed assessment. Um, and so when we work with new tools, you know, they are supplementary, but they are, we also try to use as wide a variety of tools in one research project so that our conclusions are as robust as possible. Thank you. And uh, it also brings me to the next uh, thing. You also said democratizing uh, information really important concept because uh, I believe uh, everybody, almost everybody who, who is watching this video must have seen the movie like uh, 13 days Cuba Missile Crisis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that around that time only as you said only government has uh, this uh, capability to do such uh, such light imagery. So, but now uh, almost everybody can do that using some certain mm -hmm. tools. So by doing that, perhaps those people, like you know, people like Kim Jong Il, Kim Jong, they are aware that we are doing that kind of analysis. So do you think, uh, in your experience, did you have uh, that kind of feeling that, uh, for example, North Korea is sending a signal? To yes. Find yeah. out more. <laughs> we are doing absolutely, this. Absolutely. Absolutely. Very. Um, the the fact that we can use satellite imagery to I wouldn't say spy it's such a negative connotation but to assess and to look at other countries that's not a, it's not a secret it's something that everybody knows that we do um, that everyone does and so there are instances where we have noticed that North Korea is doing something on purpose in imagery to send us a message. Um, this often happens not just with satellite imagery, but with when we receive uh, kind of state media blasts about tests that have happened, whatnot. 
Um, one of my coworkers is so good about finding where North Korea conducts its tests, despite them trying to conceal their whereabouts. Um, he's just brilliant at it. And so we notice that every single time we figured out where uh, a test was occurring, they would step up their um, attempts to conceal their locations. And as best we know, we're, we have a pretty good track record, even with them trying to obscure their locations of being able to you know, find where they are. Um, so yes, it's uh, trying to obscure information, but also trying to send signals. So we have to be kind of careful when we're looking at imagery of you know what actually we're looking at. Does this make sense with uh, kind of reality? Is this a signal? There are certain certain things that we have to take into consideration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so interesting, and uh, so that leads to my like next question. Uh, could you go back to your slide? I think it's 10 when you were talking about saturated imagery, synthetic uh, aperture radar. That one, there are some little bit of a moving uh, mountain. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So in, you mentioned that, uh, so thanks to this uh, analysis, so, so you found that North Korea has a much uh, advanced capability mm -hmm. in, nuclear weapons, basically thermonuclear weapons, right? This, so because the scale, destruction scale was uh, much mm -hmm. larger than you could see the usual such right, like optical image or some other. So, yeah. yeah. So this was one, one piece of information that led us mm -hmm. to that conclusion. Um, and actually there was a, um, a report that just came out a couple of weeks ago, I can't remember, it might have been the group of um, Indian scientists, like don't quote me on that, I don't remember exactly, who got some uh, other synthetic aperture radar data and could actually measure the exact change in um, elevation of the mountain. And using that data, they could also assess the yield of the explosion um, and the yield that they came to was approximately um, kind of dead center in the, the range that we had kind of provided when uh, we had done our analysis. Um, and we actually worked with some uh, seismologists to help us come to those um, conclusions. I see, thank you. So based on your analysis, uh, uh, do you think it is a fair accurate to say that North Korea has already possessed the capability to, to use, or I don't know what to say, but the thermonuclear weapons and also the missile capabilities that reaches to the continental United States. And can, mm -hmm. can they also put a warhead on the missile? Yes. Yes. So, mm, that sounds very, uh, scary situation and uh, it's not great <laughs> not great yeah not definitely not great so maybe this is a this is a kind of open discussion and it's almost one hour so i'm kind of a uh, end with this kind of open discussion question so how uh, this type of uh, technology to find uh, accurate information can contribute to the diplomacy to make a positive progress. Although at this point, uh, if you talk about any positive development in North Korea's denuclearization, maybe you may think uh, I'm a very Pollyannic, <laughs> but, but still, since this is a high school student's program and mm -hmm. our, our theme is uh, toward a world free of nuclear weapons, the role of youth as a change agent. So I still really want to give a sum up like a positive uh, information and also some uh, something uh, like a forward looking. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll just say, so I, I'll, I'll leave it as a discussion question for the students, but my kind of quick take is that this type of research and this type of information, it's hard to refute. 
you can, it, when you show people things that they can then visualize, it's hard for them to push it out of their minds. And so they can't, um, it's harder for them to dispel what you're trying to say. And so I think that in terms of uh, diplomacy, with this information, you can then negotiate and try to have those relations on a very transparent and open playing field. Um, certain governments might not like that or might not want to operate that way, but kind of our role as kind of civil society is to try and push countries towards um, having a more open and informed discussion. Great, thank you so much. So with that note, um, I really believe that uh, organization like us, uh, Research Institute and the civil society and uh, students like you have uh, lots of important roles to play, perhaps mm -hmm. both the short term and the long term for more peaceful and uh, more secure world. So I really appreciate uh, Anne for this uh, lecture. So thank you so much. And thank you so much for watching this lecture video. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.